So, freedom of expression and the climate crisis. The moderator of our first panel is head of partnerships at UNESCO liaison office here in Brussels. She will introduce the panelists. Laurence Gillois, and may I ask the panelists to come forward also? Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon with you and very warm welcome to everyone uh, to our first panel on communicating the environmental crisis, raising voices, countering disinformation and advocating for change. So as I was introduced, my name is Laurent Gillois. I'm the head of uh, partnerships at UNESCO Brussels office. And I'm really delighted to be your moderator this afternoon for this session. As actually it was introduced already, uh, today we gather with a shared purpose to celebrate freedom of the press, freedom of expression, and honor women and men and organizations that make a difference in protecting and promoting these values. So I'm really pleased to be here today. As you might know, uh, this year, World Pre Press Freedom Day is dedicated to the vital connection between press freedom and the many environmental uh, challenges that the planet is currently facing, including climate change. This is actually the first time the UN is dedicating a global discussion on this correlation, ensuring the safety of journalists reporting on the environment and simultaneously tackling climate change, denial, and misinformation. Uh, a recent study uh, UNESCO published reveals a disturbing trend, and this was also introduced in the, in the session. 70% of environmental reporters have faced attacks, threats, or pressures due to their work. 70%, it's a lot. And of course, uh, over the course of the past 15 years, 44 environmental journalists have tragically lost their lives, 44. So today, um, on World Press Freedom Day, it is also alarming to note that almost half of the environmental journalists admit to practicing self-censorship, driven by fear for repercussions, risk for their sources, and or conflict of interests. So these revelations actually underscore how the crucial concerns about press freedom and the protection of those who report on critical environment uh, uh, issues. The access to reliable information, the importance of strengthening independent environmental journalism, as well as the need to build bridges between media professionals, scientific communities, digital content creators, activists and policy makers are more crucial than ever. And these are the issues we will discuss with our dear panelists today. So now I'm really pleased uh, to introduce you um, to our panelists. Starting with you, uh, Sevim. Sevim Aktas, you are policy officer at DG Climate Action. And you are also curating an Instagram account entitled EU Green Deal Brief uh, about, uh, to inform uh, the public about EU environmental policies. So very warm welcome, Sevim. Now turning to you. Thank you. Thank you. Miroslava uh, Nikolai is an activist from Serbia. Miroslava, you work for the organization Polycol. Warm welcome to you, Miroslava. And uh, Arthur Nesson is an award-winning freelance journalist uh, who has been focusing for the past 15 years on environmental topics and working notably for The Guardian. Warm welcome to you, Nelson. Arthur, sorry. Now, actually starting with you, uh, Arthur, in a world grappling with environmental crisis, journalists play a vital role by informing raising awareness, 
generating debates and also questioning policies and politicians. So Arthur, can you share with us one or two successful climate-related reporting examples from your uh, experience and instances where, from your point of view, your coverage effectively raised awareness about climate issues? Thanks, Arthur. Is, is this it's on? on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't actually expecting that question. Um, one or two successful climate reports I've done. Uh, I would probably point to a couple of stories which have um, contributed in some respect to changes in the law or changes to um, protocols. You know, as a journalist, journalism is about the the process of change, and if you can contribute to that in a positive way, then obviously it's very rewarding. Um, there was one story I did where, for instance, I revealed um, that a Monsanto, that, that a, a European Commission report on glyphosate had been largely copy and pasted um, from a, a Monsanto uh, text that was uh, then submitted um, into the regulatory process um, that was backed up by the European Parliament and it led to a, um, a European parliamentary probe internally. Um, there was another story I did about lobbying which took place over, I think it was the Industrial Emissions Directive and the way in which delegates uh, from the utilities and from polluting industries were um, being taken by nation states to negotiate um, the regulation which would be applied to themselves. It was a, a classic case of um, the foxes uh, guarding the hen house. They were determining the laws in effect um, by which they would be judged. I mean, I can, I can kind of string out a number of these. Um, a few months ago, I did a story um, about the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization um, talking to whistleblowers within it, uh, who, who revealed um, that their work on livestock um, methane emissions had been sabotaged, undermined, undermined that they'd been victimized for it, that they'd been passed over promo for pr promotions, precisely because uh, th this work um, undercut um, the livestock industry's uh, objectives at that time of increasing herd sizes. Um, to feed the world by 2050, as, as they would argue it. Um, but livestock are also responsible for around 18.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and there's no way of meeting the Paris climate goal, goals unless that's addressed. So it was quite important to look at the institutional obstacles um, to climate change, um, and, and meaningful, in this case, data collection, but ultimately regulatory reform, and that's... Um, what Thanks. Should do. Thanks, Arthur. And building on these uh, examples of, you know, successful uh, reporting on climate issues, could you elaborate on the challenges uh, that you faced when preparing these reports, when working on these reports, or these ones or other in, in particular? And um, what are actually the difficulties about communicating uh, about such a complex issues. And um, if you could also elaborate on the type of support actually you would need um, from institutions or from uh, the wider public on those issues. Thanks. Well, in terms of support, I, th I think, you know, the, there's several areas where you need support. One is uh, from your editors. Uh, it's very important. Uh, in, at the end of the day, they're the people, they're your shield. They're the people who are supposed to protect you. You need... Um, support from the authorities. That's particularly the case in the developing world where journalists are most at risk. Um, more broadly, uh, it helps to have support from civil society. Um, it certainly helps to have the backing of your union as uh, one person you're weak, as a union you're strong. I mean, as, as tens of thousands of journalists supporting you, you know, you, you have a stronger voice. Um, I mean, I said in the developing world, I mean, th there is a different order of magnitude of threats facing journalists working in the developing world, and that was evidenced by what happened to Dom Phillips, the, gu the Guardian freelancer in the Amazon, uh, who was killed in the Amazon, 
while researching his book a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, that was a wake-up call, but as you say, um, it, it happens all the time to people um, working for much smaller, more obscure journals, and it, which receives far less press. I mean, in, in a sense, that sort of violence, I, I, I think, is inevitable when you're researching um, environmentally destructive, often illegal, uh, big money activities paid for sometimes by, by local businessmen, sometimes by criminal syndicates, sometimes by Western multinationals in poor countries with underdeveloped legal systems. You know, I mean, my own experience there is, is limited. I mean, I've, I've been, my life has been threatened and I've been attacked in the West Bank and Gaza, not working on environmental stories. That was prior to my career as an environmental journalist um, when, I, when I was uh, covering the Middle East and writing books there. Um, but, but even in terms of access, which is another crucial point for journalists, you need access to places, people, um, and documents. Um, when I was working, when I was covering COP23 in Marrakesh, I think it was two, 2016, um, I had to travel clandestinely to Western Sahara, or, or the border of Western Sahara, uh, to report on the Terrafa wind farm complex because the local Saharawi people um, were saying that this was a way of entrenching, as they saw it, the occupation of their land, of, of their homeland, um, and depriving them of um, the, the, the income which it would generate and control and power over um, their own energy supplies. I mean, there's, I've got a list of things here. I, I, I mean, apart from the sort of mundane things, the practical things, technical things, um, I, think there's, I think one of the big challenges is avoiding cheerleading for governments or businesses and, unless they deserve to be cheerleaded. I mean, if they do, then you should. But, I mean, um, you know, I, I, mean, I once worked for a, for a journal who had a, a slogan, um, uh, politicians, you've got a lot of explaining for us to do. And, you know, respectfully, I disagree. I don't think... Our role as journalists is to explain on politicians' behalf. Our job is to hold them to account. Our job is to monitor what they're doing and to, and to underline it and to reveal it when it is different in public from what they say in private or when what they say in public is primarily greenwash, um, trying to get a headline um, at the expense of actually meaningfully reducing emissions. Thanks, thanks, Esther, and thanks for highlighting the importance of uh, not necessarily being cheerleading and uh, rather questioning um, uh, policy, politicians and institutions as a role of journalists. And thanks also for uh, sharing other uh, challenges and also, of course, ensuring access um, uh, to the sources and access to the information. But I'd like now to move to um, addressing one big uh, challenge that we are also collectively facing right now, is climate disinformation. And the battle against climate disinformation is actually critical for our uh, sustainable future. And we've seen, unfortunately, in recent years, extensive effort to create confusion, uh, question scientists' uh, integrity and deny established facts. And uh, now more than ever, we need media and information literacy skills uh, to make informed de decisions um, about environmental issues. So uh, the uh, next questions are going to delve a little bit more into this and to see uh, strategies on how to address this. So now moving to you, Miroslava if you could share from your own experience uh, example of climate disinformation in Serbia and what is the impact of these fold narratives um, in general and also what does your organization do uh, to address it? So regarding the climate uh, misinformation, when you live in a country where most of the media are privatized and they're privatized by the people who are connected with the ruling party, which is um, right-wing and authoritarian, um, you have to find different ways to navigate and tell the stories about climate change or environmental uh, protection and pollution. So 
the thing that is problematic in our country is also, for example, the tabloids, um, that you think people, so older people buy it, it's cheap, and they think they're being informed, but they're actually not being informed. And the topic of, in, of the climate change or environment in general is a very complex topic. And you, when you have tabloids, they're not going to write about environment. They don't really care. It's a fun for people to read. Um, so what we do as the organization, we actually go and talk with people on the field that have issues. Um, Usually what we do is um, we uh, talk with people who are fighting against mini hydropower plants or mining and allowing, uh, they actually kind of know already, especially people in rural areas, but we, through our fight, we try to connect the, for example, water or protection of water, even if all the things were okay, you would still have impact of climate change on the water. So while doing all this, we also have media campaign, our social media campaign, where we advocate or we think of funny or creative ways how to include people, uh, but also this, the, the people who are watching are not always the people who are endangered in the rural areas, for example. So you have this combination of you know, social media advocating, and then you also have field work where um, if you, you kind of listen to people, you talk with them, and you build this solidarity in order for them to understand what's going on with the, with the environment. And you also allow them, or not even allow them, uh, but you support them in networking. So we had an event uh, this year that got activists that are dealing with mining, with Rio Tinto and everything in Serbia from three different continents. And then they all connected. So they got the information about each other. They got the information about the issues and they realized that the, the issues that they are s suffering from are present everywhere. So also networking and connecting people regarding the climate issue or the protection of the environment is also part of our work. So it's very important that you talk with people, that you connect them and that you uh, go on the field and talk with them. Thanks. And uh, going back to you, Arthur, as a journalist and building on what Miroslav has said about the example, uh, as a journalist, how do you address climate disinformation in your reporting? Because it's such a wave of disinformation that we are currently facing in your day-to-day -day work. I mean, how do you address this? And if you can share with us some tools and perhaps uh, fast-checking practices yeah. that you have. Okay, I guess the first thing to say is, uh, I mean, uh, cliche, but it depends what you mean by disinformation. I mean, one, one person's uh, climate disinformer is another person's stakeholder input um, and often it's, it's biased. yeah I mean often it's paid for by the same people um, <laughs> you know d dealing with trolls on social media I, I you know is easier for me I just ignore them for the most part and there are some that follow me around and sort of you know are abusive or whatever and I just ignore them um, they, they, I mean they're, they're obviously their, their objective is to, is to engage you um, in and get I ideally get a gotcha quote or uh, you know at least show you know elevate their own importance and there's no point in in playing that game with them um, I could talk about particular examples um, I mean in terms of info and fact checking I, I tend to use I mean people like carbon briefing d smog there's there's a lot of others that will provide you with uh, material um, for, for sort of responding to uh, online climate denial tropes. I mean, it's, uh, as, as a journalist, I tend to go to, I mean, I, th I think the bigger problem really is, is the sort of industry science um, sort of thing. I mean, I tend to go to IPCC authors or UN or government experts um, for comments or to respond to points that are made um, by scientists who may not have conflict of interest, but nonetheless are arguing the perspectives of the people who pay for their institutes. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's important to interrogate their arguments on their own merits, um, but it's also important to look at, you know, who stands to benefit from them and who has a dog in that fight 
and what, what has their track record been and you know particularly to look at things like big tobacco's playbook and see if that's being repeated um, as it has been by big oil uh, for example with tactics to delay uh, deflect dis distract and then derail public interest legislation um, and and the same argument which big oil used to use about what they called sound science is increasingly used um, you know today by big oil um, and by big agriculture and by big pharma or chemical industry um, to, to, to prevent any meaningful um, regulation. So, so again, I think historical awareness is important too. Thanks. Uh, now moving to you, Sevim, uh, working for the European Commission. So from your perspective, what are the consequences of climate mis and disinformation and climate on a climate mobilization and support to environmental policies? And uh, if you could elaborate also on how does the EU actually address this issue? Yeah, totally. Um, first of all, first of all, welcome everyone, and uh, nice being here. Um, I've, I mean, the two different strands of mis disinformation, I would say. I mean, many topics in uh, in environmental policy, so climate action, they're just grey zones in a sense. Like, oh, is hydrogen good or bad? Like, should we go for it or not go for it? Or EVs, are they more like emission intensive or not emission intensive? Like. There's so many factors coming in, and honestly, on many things, and even though I know a lot about these topics, I still don't have an opinion. So there's one thing that I would like to take away in a, in a sense of, we don't need to have an opinion about everything immediately or like judge every information that we've seen as good or bad immediately. We can also just observe and see and collect facts and give ourselves the time to do so as well. I think like this, um, this, this rush or this hustle of like, oh, getting as much information as possible and presenting it in a yes, no way, it's just not the way to go, especially in an area where a lot of innovation um, needs to take place and innovation is just risk management. So that's one thing that I wanna set apart. But talking about active strategic disinformation, misinformation narratives in particular, also like foreign uh, dis misinformation, far right dis misinformation, um, very dangerous, honestly. I mean, we all know about it. There's, um, there's no discussion about it. And um, something that, uh, that is a responsibility of all of us as individuals, but also as journalists, activists, etc., is to have open conversations about it. I think it's extremely important when we encounter people who believe in mis or disinformation. I'm sure we all encountered people like that. Is it our friends or family? Um, or in a bar, sitting over a drink is to listen, not to judge immediately, and um, don't feel personally attacked either. So asking questions helps a lot, and giving them some time also helps. I mean, I just would like you to put yourself in a position where someone comes in front of you and says like, whoa, everything that you believe in is completely wrong. Like the immediate response is defense by nature. So we need to accept that when we're dealing with people who believe in these this or misinformation narratives as well. Um, looking from a perspective of what the European Union is doing uh, when it comes to uh, yeah, tackling uh, foreign dis or misinformation, uh, I mean, it's various things. So this is falling under the responsibility of the External Action Service. You can see it as the Foreign Affairs Ministry of the European Union. And um, their strategic communication division is like really focused on in particular this. So they call it uh, foreign information um, um, in manipulation and interference. I pronounce it like I'll, I'll abbreviate it the German way, FIMI. It's probably like FIMI or something, I don't know. But they abbreviate it, I say FIMI, okay? Um, and um, they, uh, I mean, first of all, like they developed several different tools, starting up with the framework and the methodology on how to analyze these incidents, these foreign information, dis um, uh, disinformation attacks. And Coincidentally, I worked with the data scientists that were developing this framework um, in one of my previous roles, and I was shocked. I've never been exposed so, like, I was, it was never in my awareness how, how vulnerable we are and how many attacks are happening. And this is not only to, like, over social media through bots or something to, you know, us as consumers, but also towards institutions, uh, news um, media platforms, like, is it 
I've, I've seen like, um, I was going over the report, the annual reports, which I would completely recommend if you're interested, at least read the abstract. Um, it was super interesting to see, but it's like 150 organizations last year that were attacked by foreign disinformation um, uh, attacks, let me say, or, or organizations. These are really strategic things that are going on. Um, well, towards the institutions, towards member states, um, towards NATO, towards yeah, Reuters, um, um, uh, Financial Times, whatever. Like, you, you, I, I was uh, I was really shocked. But okay, so there's this framework. Um, they have an alert system that they developed together with the member states as well um, to coordinate actions. So this is like external action service with the European institutions as well as member states, trying to like have a common framework of how to spot it and then also an alert system and then trying to like actively counter those things. So this is really like on an institutional level as well. And have a toolbox as well. So this is like, okay, how do we deal with all these type of um, um, attacks? And uh, here I can uh, put close to you, well, two things in particular, namely EU versus Disinfo. It's a website where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter where you yeah, get like an overview of different disinformation narratives all around Europe. Um, and uh, they also like a learning corner with like a lot of educational uh, tools, etc., which I found very nice to, to scroll through. So at least like have a look and see what's interesting there. And second is the annual report, which I, um, very briefly in one sentence. Um, they publish annual reports, exactly bringing these topics together, providing you an analysis and the tools on how to tackle this. And one of the key topics of loss, the latest publication is the elections. Um, and they also propose specific measures on how to go about like this or misinformation uh, campaigns that are going on in, for the upcoming elections. So, and they have a special report for LGBTQ community disinformation, misinformation tax as well. I found it super interesting to have a look into, so if you're interested, I can close it, put it very closely to your heart. Thanks a lot, Sevim. Arthur, I saw you wanted to, to intervene on one point uh, raised by Sevim, but before you, you do so, I'd like to bring us to the next point we wanted to discuss, uh, but then you can bring the two uh, answers together, if that's okay with you, just for the sake of time, because I'd like uh, to give a chance to the audience to also ask questions. Um, so if you could also address, um, just after addressing the point you wanted to raise, uh, the point about synergies uh, between actors and how you collaborate between uh, with scientists, experts, climate activists uh, in your work, in your reporting. And I hope you didn't forget the point you wanted to raise. No, no, I, I, it's, it's not directly related to, to environment and climate. I, I, I mean, there's been many attempts to influence editors I've worked for. It, it's just, it was just on, 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 on a point that Sevin was making. Um, it just reminded me of something that happened many years ago, again, when I was in the Middle East, just because it's specifically about a concerted effort to change um, the media coverage, which happened over, I, I used to work for The Economist when I, when I was based in Israel and Palestine, and um, I, I used to write that they had something called a city's guide. I, on, it was only online, and um, I had to do a roundup of news from, from Tel Aviv, and um, I, di I did one, one month, I did a couple of stories. One was about a rabbi in Bnei Brak who um, decided well, he told he told his congregants that they were not, he he it was an in, uh, he told them they couldn't um, lease their property to to non-Jews that if they leased their property to Arabs um, that they would have to leave his synagogue, um, which was a bit of a outrageous thing to so, so that was one of the stories and the other one was about racial profiling at Ben Gurion Airport. Now after that, there's a group uh, called HonestReporting.com, which is a pro-Israel advocacy organisation, which put out an alert to all its members, uh, saying flood the Economist with complaints about these two stories, and everyone sent the same email to my editors saying, um, why is the Economist singling out um, Israel for negative press coverage? And th that was the argument that this was negative press coverage. Um, that I should have been writing positive stories about Israel, which presented, you know, the country in a positive light, which which is not what journalism does. I mean, plain land safely is, you know, might be a story in North Korea. It's not a story anywhere else. And and my editors stood by me. And I, and in terms of how I can bring this in, um, it's very important to have your editors on your side to back you up, um, and also civil society in those situations. Um, what else? Um, 
I collaborate all the time with scientists and uh, particularly environmental scientists. Um, I think it was last week or the week before, I was working with Matthew Hayek and Paul Behrens uh, for a piece again on livestock emissions, which is one of my um, uh, stories I've been focusing a lot on. The week before that, with some people from uh, some of the NGOs, Julia Christian from FERN, the Forest Conservation Group, Peter de uh from E3G, a climate think tank, and that was for an op-ed about the Green Deal, which I did for The Guardian. Um, I work with, um, I mean, the, I mean, as, as a rule, as a journalist, you, you have to try and have as broad as possible um, a, a network of people that you can be in touch with about stories. I'm currently talking to activists. I'm talking to students um, at the University of Ghent uh, who um, are planning to occupy their university on Monday. Um, in, I mean, it's partly they were inspired by what's happening in America. They want the university to divest uh, from Israeli institutions, but it's also they want um, binding actions to deliver the university's sustainability goals for 2030. Um, so it's the two issues, uh, Gaza and global warming. Um, I, I think probably the most valuable, um, the most valuable uh, people that I collaborate with are whistleblowers. And those are the most difficult people to find, and they're the most honorable, and they're the bravest people. And journalists get the credit for stories, but it's whistleblowers who really deserve um, the credit for stories, and I wish they got more, but um, often they can't, just because of the nature of what they're doing, it has to be anonymous. Um, but, but the whistleblowers I've worked have, have, with have um, always delivered the best stories. Thanks for underlining the role of whistleblowers yeah. and uh, probably also you, Miroslava, you work uh, with whistleblowers also. So going b to the question on synergies between actors in your uh, daily work, how do you actually rely on journalists, scientists, institutions to support your advocacy work? Um, we have uh, some uh, amount of people, of scientists that we collaborate with, but the thing is, most of them are in pension. Uh, because the academia is run by some of the institutions and they get money from the state and the, yet again, it's uh, the party in the power is right wing, they're not really free to talk about the scientists in particular, they're not really free to talk about uh, and to uh, speak about the issues, for example, of the climate change. Uh, but we do have a couple of scientists that uh, speak publicly, two of them. Um, when it comes to uh, journalism and journalists, um, the thing is that a lot of um, budget for the, for the journalism dropped. So the journalists are kind of um, in this position that they have to work you know, recording, editing, a like, bunch of stuff. And so because they're short on time, they cannot really go into depth of the, of the, for example, environmental issue or climate issue. So we have very broad, very, you know, very plain information from journalists. But as the time goes by um, and the, we have different projects and events, I'm meeting um, a lot of journalists who want to report, uh, who are foreigners sometimes, uh, who want to report on the issues that we have uh, regarding the environment in Serbia. So, um, yeah, we kind of collaborate, but now the, the uh, bubble of the people is spreading, so it's good that we have, uh, that, we, that I'm actually able to talk with you as well, and that I hope we get to collaborate. Uh, Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll follow the uh, your reports uh, and then we'll hear from both of you. You wanted to add something? Um, maybe I would just add that um, it's important to involve all of these people because um, when we uh, talk about our narrative, we really need data to prove the the legitimacy of the story, to prove the legitimacy of issue. So. It's really important to work with scientists. It's really important to uh, have somebody also in the news, but also um, uh, this all is very long uh, fight for the justice, for the environment. So if we don't um, work together and if we don't uh, 
tackle this issue from different sides, from legal side, from media side, from terrain side, um, I don't think we could get much far, but luckily we are doing this, uh, and so the things are changing, but it's a very slow process and we need support from everybody to make a change. Thanks, Miroslava. Now, going back to you, Sevim, I've mentioned you created an Instagram account to inform about uh, EU environmental policy. How do you see your role as a policy officer and content creator uh, to reinforce each other? Um, so, in general, also in your view, what role do social media play uh, in climate mobilization and action? And um, before turning to, to you, uh, the audience, I will take after two, uh, one or two questions, and then I will ask uh, each panelist to wrap up uh, in answering your question. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, just to clarify, so in my day-to-day -day role in the commission, I work on policy development and carbon removal, so it's very different and very technical work as well. And on the side, in my free time, I share energy and climate knowledge on my on my Instagram um, career tips, like making the EU institution a little bit more accessible. And uh, I found it very funny, actually, in the fact that uh, there's this institutional communication that I need to do once in a while as well when we, I don't know, like um, our regulation passed the, the, uh, the negotiations or something versus what I do on, uh, on Instagram. And I thought because I, you know, I consider myself quite okay on Instagram and get good feedback, I would be also good in institutional communication. It's two different strands of things. So... Um, what I've observed, and these are observations from an engineer, guys, like this is, like I, I have no idea about communication and uh, no idea about politics, essentially. So these are like observations from the last four years. Um, I've noticed that there's a difference how, um, how the source is being perceived or like where the source is coming from. So uh, from an institutional or politician perspective, the, the information tends to be attacked way more quicker, like these bots and like, or, or trolls, etc., tend to be more prone to um, uh, to attack that type of content. Whereas I noticed, uh, and I'm doing this Instagram for two and a half years now, it's completely different interaction. It's very supportive and very very um, two way dialogue. Like it's not that. The, that the community agrees with everything that I share, but it's more like, hey, let's learn together. And this is something that I really appreciate in this interaction with, um, with, uh, with the community. So I was wondering, like, how come that there is this difference between institutional um, uh, content sharing versus my personal one? And uh, I, I've, I've heard several followers that I that I met in on events etc say one thing which made the click in my head they said I can imagine to be you and I think this is very powerful because I realized that moment that relatability makes people be more prone to take action to feel together as part of a community and like to move together as well essentially we're all learning together and they were more prone to and very happy of me being imperfect and not doing everything right all the time and like posting sometimes like, I don't know, like wrong date information or whatever. So uh, if there is one thing that I could share um, on, this, on this platform is if, if you ever considered yourself like sharing some kind of knowledge of your expertise on social media, I can only encourage you to do so because all the information as we've talked about now as well, like that people tend to share on social media, etc. It's, it's, it's overconfident people probably coming not with malicious intentions or something, but overconfident sharing like conspiracy theories or whatever type of narratives all around, uh, which makes a big share of the content in, uh, on our social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And we need to increase the share of good quality content. And I don't put my opinion to things most of the time, like never actually, I, I only make digestible briefings of credible sources. And um, if you want to start, I started it back then as an experiment. I didn't know whether I'm going to like it or I'm going to continue doing it. So if like this would be one key action that I can share with you if you're somehow interested or passionate about a topic, make sure to like just start it as an experiment, see where it goes, see whether you like it. But honestly, like it opened my eyes to a completely different world. I learned so much from it and uh, also opened so many opportunities like Thanks. sitting here and talking with you guys now. 
Thanks, Evim. And it's really about connection and making connections uh, in real and also in uh, social media. Uh, but I really want to give at least uh, the chance for one question or two questions, and then we immediately wrap up. I know we have five more minutes. I got a sign. So, uh, but I do want to give a chance to make that connection. So please raise your hand. I don't see very well from here. Uh, I see, yeah, here, third row. And then I will yes. ask uh, all of you to answer and then give a final uh, statement. Okay. Thank you very much for the wonderful panel. Uh, first, a uh, complicated topic, also from a journalistic perspective. I was uh, wondering a little bit more about the uh, notion of climate fatigue and the role that maybe uh, press and journalism can play in tackling this, this uh, lack of capacity for climate action at a social or individual level. Um, I mean, it's a little bit preached to the converted here. We are all, I think, agreeing that climate change is a major issue of our time. Uh, and we've talked about this information, but I think it's really important to also get this uh, capacity to action for future generations, for future policies. So I was wondering whether the role of journalism should be a little bit more uh, on the side of, let's say, uh, IPCC facts or this sort of climate change projections. Or if, or if it could use, from a strategic perspective, a little bit more wishful thinking and a sort of can-do attitude to incentivize change and sort of in behavior. I've always believed that change for climate change comes from yourself as an individual and, and this data comes from journalism. So maybe there can be this... If I was wondering what your perspective was on this question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. So after, I mean, uh, the question is very much also for you. But then, so we'll start with you and then we'll go this way to do the closing. Well, in terms of climate fatigue, I, I'm, you can't bang people over the head with something. I mean, if, if they don't want to hear it, they'll switch off and that's what editors hate, um, you know, and that, that's, in a sense, that's one problem, um, that once, once the, there's a sense that a story has run its course um, and, and, and it's time to move on, you then need to find a new, a new way of uh, putting a handle on it. Um, you know, yeah, we follow legislative timetables, we follow protests, what do you do? when they go down? What, what do you do when the legislation is passed or not? How do you continue the story? What, one, one of the problems, I, I, I think, with um, climate journalism, which is structural, um, and which Alan Rusbridger always used to talk about, is, is he he's the editor, was the editor of The Guardian, um, is news is based around change. It's based around something which is different one day from what happened the day before. When people come and ask me, is this, is this a good story? You know, the, the question is, What's the change factor? How is this different? How does this, um, you know, alter what, what previously existed? The, the trouble with climate change is that until very recently, it has been happening at such um, an incremental and slow, um, in our uh, cognitive uh, sphere, pace, um, that, that it doesn't seem dramatic. I mean, in, in geological time, it's the blink of an eye. But for us, something that takes 10, 20, 30 years is like not news. I mean, why should I care about that? This is something to care about in 10, 20 or 30 years. So yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a real issue how we, how we get that immediacy, how we keep the immediacy of, of the issue going. And you know, the way I've tried to do it m through most of my career is by focusing on the lobbying which takes place to prevent the change we need. Because what you will find every time there's a COP, Every time there's a COP process, you will get every government and industry trade association, they save up all their for you know BS stories and they will throw them at the press. And journalists need to, throw, to get a story published so that their editor will like and it needs to have a good headline. And so it will be more than 40 countries say they're going to give up coal in an unprecedented step, according to Boris Johnson. That's what happened at COP26. In, in fact, you know, they, they made up 13% of the world's coal consumers. It was, it was a nothing, and there was nothing new announced which hadn't already been the case beforehand. But it got headlines, and people didn't begin to reflect on it until a week or two later and then realized they'd been had. So, I, I, so in terms of how we can keep it going, I think it's, it's, just, it's not an ongoing 
conspiracy. It's just the nature of politics that there are forces which, which act openly and forces which try to act you know, more discreetly to, to achieve their objectives and trying to um, put the spotlight on them when they're doing so. Thanks, Arthur. Miroslava, one final word. <laughs> one word. Um, lobbying and narrative and working with people. Thank you. And you, Sevim, your final word? Saying climate change or climate action without saying climate change or climate action. So say climate change without saying climate change. And what I mean by that is I would love to see stories or narratives where climate change or climate action is not the primary objective of the story, but the indirect outcome. Like climate awareness is the indirect outcome of the story that we read. Because honestly, I have climate fatigue as well. In my private life, I cannot see climate action anymore. Like I see it all the time. And many of us is the same. And my family who is not really in, like none of them are specialized in climate action area. They're the same. So let's try to talk about the subject in an indirect way. And I think that's like, could be a very powerful tool. Thank you very much to you, Sevim, to you, Miroslava, and to you, Arthur, and to all of you for this very rich discussion. Time to move to the next session. Thank you. And thank you to the moderator, Laurence Gillois. Thank you. I think we can talk for hours and hours about every topic that we will address today. But unfortunately, we only have like 45 uh, minutes for every uh, panel discussion.